There we go. We'll start recording. So we have, let's see, this morning I updated grades for homework one. Not everyone has finished it, so I can't go over it in class, but if you look through your answers and you're not sure why you missed something, or if you think there's a mistake in the answer key, please let me know. Um, I do want to make sort of a, a public service announcement that I, I spoke with a few of you and I had emails from others that expressed concern that they didn't know this already. And I just want to iterate, I would not waste your time with something that I hope that you know already. So the objective of homework one was to practice the idea of the vocabulary that we're acquiring, the way that the, the model matrices sort of fit together, the idea that G and R combine to make V, and if there is no G, level two separation, then R is just all of the variants sort of in one pile. And keep in mind that at this point in your, your schooling, so to speak, everything should be a challenge, right? Like if this was something that you could learn on your own in 10 minutes, then we would all be wasting our time. So if it feels uncomfortable, I'm sorry, but good, because that means that we're hitting the spot where you are actually trying to learn new things and let me know if you do have questions. As these homeworks progress, if you want to walk through your logic with me, that is completely fine. When you get to the drop-down questions, I cannot tell you whether you're right or not, but what I can do is listen to you and confirm whether your logic is sound and apply any corrections that are needed to your understanding. So most of the time I sit in office hours unattended. Feel free to stop by and ask whatever you want. If office hours don't work for you, let me know if you want to schedule an individual Zoom meeting, and we can do that as well. So any questions on that that I can answer? <laughs> yes, sir. So for the AR1 models, how do you find R? How do I find R? Yeah. Um, so R is the variance covariance version, whereas R core is correlation. Okay. And so I mean like the, the little, like the R... Oh, you mean the R parameter? Yeah. It should be given directly. Okay. So that is a parameter, and the way the AR model works is that the correlation is given directly. That indirectly creates the covariance that shows up in R. So R core is how that's specified. Okay. Yeah. And it is less important to me that you memorize, like, this pattern works this way and that pattern works that way. I just want you to be aware that there are choices. <laughs> that Really, that's it. Because if you're used to thinking about um, repeated measures in NOVA as a framework for longitudinal data, there's only two choices, right? Everything's the same or everything's different. And the idea of this semester is that we're adding in middle ground choices by which we can use fewer parameters but still try to reasonably approximate the variances and covariances over time. So the, the ACS models is one strategy, and those are going to be most useful for data sets in which there's no individual change. So fluctuation types of data. Where we are this week and for the next many weeks is on the change side. So we're talking about growth curve models. That's the terminology that we will be using, even though we're not necessarily focusing on growth and even though it's not necessarily a curve, it could just be linear, but that's the term that's being used. And the big difference is that the idea of random slopes for change over time are then going to imply another set of patterns and the patterns are going to be occasion-specific and individual-specific, which makes them really flexible for most longitudinal data. Okay, anything else that you want to ask about or go over before we jump back into stuff? Feeling okay? Happy Garbage Day? It is Tuesday, after all. It's Garbage Day every day somewhere in the world. That much I know. So it's Happy Garbage Day from Coralville, Iowa, in my neighborhood. Let me start the screen share, Zoomers. I didn't forget you. I promise. I just wasn't referring to anything specifically yet. All right. So I am on Lecture 5, Slide 21, to remind us of the choices that we've looked at so far. So this picture A here in the top left-hand corner, what kind of model would predict this pattern of no change overall and no individual differences in change? Yeah, empty. Empty means, specifically, meaning nothing in it but a fixed intercept that implies constant means across time. And on the variant side, random intercept only, but that's not true. What else is still in it that's always there? What's always in the model for the variance, whether you add it or not? Mm, the 
was futile? The residual variance. So we're talking about additions beyond that because the idea that there is some discrepancy between what the model says and what the outcome is is always there. So beyond E, random intercept only, that would allow people to have different levels of Y, but to not have different slopes. So then we moved over to B, and we looked at the addition of what? What differentiates B from A in this picture? The fixed effect of time. Yeah, fixed time slope. And in this case, it's linear specifically, which implies constant change. So there is a constant rate of change for every additional unit of time, month, day, year, whatever your units happen to be. And what kind of individual differences in change are implied in this picture? Yeah, no, yeah, none, basically. Constant differences between people. So these top pictures here are consistent with a random intercept only in the model for the variance. Parallel change. This is the only situation in which univariate repeated measures ANOVA would be okay, because it's a compound symmetry parallel change kind of prediction. Okay, with me so far? Nodding, nodding, thumbing. Okay, excellent. So then C and D here. These pictures both add in the idea of a random time slope, which is everybody gets their own rate of change. But critically, the way that that works is that the random slope is phrased as a deviation from the fixed slope in the same way that the random intercept is phrased as a deviation from the fixed intercept. So that's C and D. The difference would be whether or not there is a non-zero fixed time slope. In C, there's a zero time slope on average for the fixed slope, and in D, there'd be a non-zero. So we started looking at that in the multi-level notation, which is slide 22 here. We'll make this big. So should we go back over notation? Mm -hmm. I think we should. Do you know why I think that? Because the next thing I'm going to have you do is fill out a chart all about notation. So your next formative assignment was posted this morning. It is not inside the quizzes. So it is a Word document that is posted to the website for formative assessment three. It's also linked from inside icon under assignments. So it's a Word chart that I'm going to ask you to fill out and then upload your completed version and you'll get your two points and we'll go over it in class. But the idea is to get used to seeing this multi-level notation and understanding what it has in it and what it doesn't have in it. So YTI, so time is level one, persons are level two. The, the level one model then describes the time level prediction. So any predictors that vary over time go into the level one model, such as time. This model has beta zero I. Is that a parameter or a placeholder? Placeholder. Placeholder is not a thing. It is a wrapper, a container, a placeholder, a backpack. Pick your metaphor. Likewise, beta 1i, placeholder or parameter? Whoa. No. Yeah. Not in this case. It's a placeholder. Oh, because it has two things. So yeah, in the fixed linear slope model, beta 1i is the fixed slope, just with a different label attached to it. Then in this case, it's a, it's a container. So that's why those two beta terms are in black. They represent the idea that we are allowing each person to have their own intercept and their own slope. The level two model then describes how that happens. So beta zero I is the placeholder that contains the fixed intercept in red, gamma zero zero. And because time is in the model in level one, this is now the predicted mean on average at time zero. So the predicted mean from the line, not exactly the mean at time zero, but the one that's predicted. And U0i is the deviation from that prediction for that particular individual. So the total intercept is the sum of the fixed part that everybody gets and the random part that is individual specific. So we would never have a random effect that doesn't have a fixed effect to go with it because the fixed effect is essentially the mean of that random effect distribution. The random effects have a mean of zero because the, the mean is elsewhere in the model. Likewise, similar structure, 
different term, theta 1. This is the placeholder for how each person gets their own time slope. It starts out with the fixed time slope, which is the change in y per unit time, constant, linear. And then we have the random slope. So because we have this random slope in here, the definition of the fixed slope is essentially the average of the person slopes. So if people contribute a different number of occasions, then the fixed slope that you get without the random slope will differ once the random slope is added. So U1 then is a slope deviation. It's how far off of the average slope your slope is. So we would never have a model with just u1 in it without the gamma 1 o term to go with it. The mean slope comes first and then the deviation. So they work together. If I were to remove the beta placeholders, the composite model, as it's called, is at the bottom here. And so the first set of parentheses is the individual intercept composed of fixed and random. Then the individual time slope composed of fixed and random. And e is what's left. Okay, how are we doing? All right, so your formative assessment is building up to this model, but looking for you to explain and define each of the terms in the nested models with fewer stuff in it. Question? I think the link's broken. The link is broken? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll fix it. See, I actually planned that because I didn't want you filling it out during class. Okay. How's that for, how's that in your excuse? Does that sound plausible? That sounds totally plausible to me. Let's go with that. Thank you for telling me. I will fix it after class. It's not due until next Monday. So you got time to work on it. And as usual, points for trying. And I will post the answer key after we go over it, by the way. For this one, I will, because it's more, uh, it's difficult to, to write everything down as we talk. Okay, so in terms of added parameters, when we add a random linear slope, we also add something else that is not shown in these equations. We add the covariance between u0 and u1. It makes sense that if u0 and u1 refer to the same person, they should be allowed to relate. And some people think that this is potentially a testable hypothesis, and the rest of us say, absolutely not. It always goes in. Absolutely always the covariance comes with it it is unreasonable to expect that two random effects that refer to the same person would not be related at least somewhat. But it doesn't get shown in this equation because covariances don't contribute to predicted values. In order to see where it shows up, we have to do matrices. So we're adding, basically the G matrix at this point is gonna become two by two. And I think that might be the next slide or almost next slide, nope. The next slide is a picture, because pictures are nice. So, breaking this down piece by piece then. Let's say that the average line for the sample is the black line, so the means through time, and the blue line is for a particular individual. So if we break down this random linear time model into the pieces. First up, gamma zero, zero, that's my fixed intercept. That is going to be the predicted outcome at time zero. So note the x-axis starts at zero for that reason. So I've centered time so that zero is the first occasion. That is probably the most common strategy. So long as zero is somewhere within your time, it's fine. So fixed intercept then would be where the line ends at time zero here. So to the best of my PowerPoint drawing ability, that's an intercept of 10 at the end of this line. The actual mean at time zero is a little bit below that. But this blue person, relative to the sample average, is starting out lower. So their random intercept would be minus 4. Putting their composite intercept from both pieces together again, it's 6. So this person is lower than average. That's why their u is negative. And if they had started out higher than everybody else, their u0 would be positive. Okay, then we get the time slope. So the fixed slope then is what happens on average. And again, to the best of my PowerPoint drawing ability, it's a slope of six. So this is rise over run or delta y over delta x, as you may have learned it initially in eighth grade or whenever. Same rules apply. So the blue person, are they changing more or less than average? 
More. More. So is their U going to be positive or negative for the U1? What do you think? Positive. Positive, yeah, indeed. It's plus 2. So then their total slope is 8. So what if they changed less than average? Then what would their U1 be? Negative. Negative. It doesn't mean they declined. It means they increased less. So we have to have the fixed slope in there as the reference point to interpret what a random slope would mean because it's phrased as a deviation from fixed. Question? I don't know if I'm going down the weird path, but this from I'll tell interaction you. terms. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, you can say that the random slopes can be either more positive, less positive, more negative, or less negative than the fixed slope. Okay. Yeah. That heuristic works in a lot of different contexts. Yep. And then what's left here? What does E do? Everything else. <laughs> Everything else, basically. E is, why are you off your line? So E is the difference between what the person actually had at each occasion and where their line said they would be. So once we get a growth curve in here, again, growing, but it's still a line, E is, why are you off your line today? It's all the reasons why people are deviating from the trajectory that has been given to them by fitting these fixed and random slopes. So the only thing in terms of predictor variables that could potentially explain and reduce that E level one residual variance is things that are time specific. Why are you off your line today? I don't know because my baby kept me up all night and I'm exhausted. Why are you off your line today? I don't know, because it's 97 degrees and I can't think in this heat. Things that are temporal, right? I can't say, why are you off your line today? Because I have a PhD. I had a PhD yesterday too, right? That's not a good enough reason. So time constant things explain why some people start out lower and why some people change faster. But time varying things explain why are you off your line today? So how many different piles of variance are in this model at this point? Three. Three. So how many different R squares would I potentially pay attention to? Three. Three. Now, how many predictor variables are in this model? One. One. How many parameters are in this model? And feel free to read from the screen. Six. Six. So these models get real complicated real quick. Okay, this, this part makes sense, at least, this sort of breakdown of what each thing is for. Okay, cool. Now, what if people don't cooperate? So let's say that we have a study of something like infant development over weeks. Babies change very, very quickly. So we wanted to measure babies at weeks 3, 6, 9, and 12. Let's say that babies are growing over time. This is the trajectory that we observe for the sample. Cool. So here's one baby that comes in at week three. They come back at week six, and then their parents just ghost you and never return your phone calls, and you can't get them back. So that's the best fit line for that baby. Fine, no worries. Now here's someone else who came in at week three when they were supposed to, and they didn't quite make it to week six because the baby was sick, and by the time they got them in, it was actually more like week seven and a half. And the same thing happened at the third occasion, so they were a little bit late but then they caught up and came in at week 12 like they were supposed to. Now the best fit line, again, to the best of my PowerPoint ability through those points would look something like this. But what if we tried to artificially balance our time? We would have to round these points into the nearest occasions. So this one would have to move over here. This one would have to move over here. And now the line is different. So we don't want to do this. We don't have to do this. If we are fitting a function through the means, then we can use for each person whichever occasions they happen to have. Time is literally going to be a predictor variable that can take any continuous value as needed. So I would not round time, ever. It's an empirical question, but it's also a theoretical question as to how much these discrepancies in measurement matter. If you're measuring babies, yeah, probably everyday measures. If you're measuring older adults and they come in two weeks late, I'm not 
sure that 85 in two weeks is very different than 85 in zero weeks. But it's up to you and the context. And there are ways to actually test the extent to which fitting another parameter for like this discrepancy from relative to where you're supposed to be contributes to the model. I do that in chapter 10, the second example because that was a case where people were supposed to come in every six months and they didn't quite make it. Now, in terms of the predicted slopes, though, it is possible in nearly every software program that runs these models to ask it to come up with an individual predicted slope based on the fixed effect for everybody and the individual random slope for each person. But what you get back is not going to be these slopes. So for this person here who only has two occasions, their slope looks really different than the other slopes in the picture. So if you were to predict the slope for this person with only two occasions, their slope is going to get pushed to look like everybody else's. There is a term for that, and the term is shrinkage. It's the idea that, that extreme predictions are shrunk to the mean to the extent that they are very different than everyone else's or to the extent that there's less data going into the prediction. So the slopes that you get back are not going to be as variable if you try to predict them than what the model would say that they would be. The exact same thing happens if you try to predict factor scores, by the way. They are shrunken to the mean to the extent that they are far away or based on less data. So the point of the story is two things. Don't round time and don't output slopes. We don't need them. That's the whole point of Latent variable modeling and random effect modeling is to be able to represent the slope variance as a latent variable and have it predict other things or be predicted directly without having to physically get the slopes for each person. So there is, um, there are different strategies that may be more or less useful depending on why you would want the slopes. Like if you want to have some kind of indicator of individual specific growth, like you're going to make some decision about a person, don't use everyone else's data. Like literally just make a line through their data and make the decision about them. Because if you do this in the context of a model, you're not getting just their predicted slope back. You're getting their predicted slope in conjunction with sort of everyone else's. And that may not be what you want if you're trying to make individual specific predictions. Okay. Yeah, summary. I knew that was coming. So these are the three models that we've talked about thus far with respect to time. Empty, meaning time's not in the model. That has three parameters in it, just a fixed intercept, level one residual variance. Hola. Hello. <laughs> you can come hang out if you want. Tomorrow we come to... And we have a special guest at the doorway. I will come in a couple of weeks. Okay. Está bien. Nos vemos. Hasta luego. Dr. Ariel Aloe, special guest in our class here. So uh, empty means, fixed intercept only, random intercept, and E, level one residual variance. If we add the fixed linear time, then we pick up this job right here. And so in this case, you could say that beta one isn't really a placeholder because it literally is just this when you substitute it in. But the notation stays the same because it allows for each of these individual terms to be defined by multiple things. And then once we pick up random linear time, the U1 term shows up here. That adds not just its own variance, but the covariance between the two. So this idea of fixed plus random gets to be your version. That is a global concept. So when we get into nonlinear slopes, like quadratics and piecewise models and everything, each piece of the model that generates that function has a fixed part and potentially a random part. So that idea is much more general. All right. Um, let's see here. I'm on the fence here. Do you want to see numbers or do you want to see like slides with concepts first? Numbers? Numbers first? Okay. Then I was on the fence as to which would be better to do first. We'll do numbers. So we'll go back to example five. And let's see here. I'm trying to think. We, did we, we didn't get to random slopes in this, did we? Or did, not yet? Trying to remember how far we got. I think we did the, we, I know we did saturated mean stuff. Oh, this is the where my boxes are all over the place. I don't know why. It's only certain handouts and it's only on this computer. 
but this is this is unacceptable. So we're going to have to open the PDF, or I'm going to lose my mind. I think it's because it's in compatibility mode. It's in what compatibility, compatibility mode? mode? Okay, I will have to see if I can fix that for the document properties. But in the meantime, I got a backup plan. So we got the PDF here. No worries. So I know that we did saturated means unstructured variance. Mm -hmm. And what's the point of that, by the way? What is the purpose of fitting that? It's a baseline. It's a baseline. The best baseline or the worst baseline? Best. This is the best. best. Yeah, this is the answer key model. So this tells us what we are trying to recreate with our fixed and random time slopes and our fixed and random intercepts. When is this model possible? Balance time. Balance time and enough people relative to the number of occasions. If you don't have enough people, this may blow up at you, even if it is balanced. But when it's possible, this is your answer key, and I would recommend fitting it first. For longitudinal designs that are very short, so like pre-test, post-test, this is it. Done and done. Don't need to look at anything else. Uh, longitudinal designs that are like pre-test, post-test, follow-up, this. Done. It's when we have unbalanced time or many occasions and we want to, to talk about sort of trajectories as opposed to just occasion-specific pairwise mean differences that going further would be necessary. Yes, sir. And I, I don't know if there's an exact answer to this, but I guess just in your mind, is there any sort of cutoff of the number of times? So, like, for instance, this one, there's four ways, right? Yes. And so... So like if you had this, would you use this model? I would not. Okay. So it, it depends on a combination of things. Balance time, uh, relatively few occasions, but also what differentiates one occasion from another. So if it's like pre-test, post-test, follow-up, like what you would expect would be like, like they get better from pre-test to post-test and then they maintain, right? So it would be like this sort of broken trajectory like this. Well, if this is what you expect, trying to draw one line through that is not going to work. It doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't make sense in context of the design, let alone the data. So when the interest is in, like, you know, did the treatment work? Well, that's the change from pre to post. Did the treatment, like, keep working after we let them go? That's the change from here to here. In that context, those particular pairwise mean differences are, are what you want to know about. And you might want to know if they differ between treatment A and treatment B or as a function of age or whatever. And so then that makes sense that we would have saturated means that would allow us to talk about this change from here to here and here to here. In this study, it's just like there's four occasions and people go up. So it would make more sense to talk about differences in change as sort of a unilateral concept as opposed to this broken like baseline post-test kind of design. So it depends is always going to be the answer, but depends on what is what I can try to, to elaborate. Okay, other questions? All right, so this is the answer key model. We got the pattern out. We established that for these made-up data, it looks like the variance is increasing over time. So this is the R matrix. Gets the unstructured, uh, every variance and covariance gets to be whatever it wants. Here's the correlation version of that, so we can see that there is a significant correlation at all times. It decreases down to about 0.45 between the first and last occasion, but still fairly high. Uh, we looked at the means, so the fixed effects then are the answer key with respect to what the fixed intercepts and slopes are supposed to be doing. And the way that this is parameterized, the intercept is the last occasion, and each of these is a pairwise mean difference relative to that. And so you can put the means back together again as linear combinations, which are down here. So these are the four means that our trajectory is trying to recreate. And I put them in pictures here. So here's the individual data, here's the means, and here's the variances. So that's, that's what we're trying to model. If the answer key is not possible, so if you have unbalanced data, what I would do temporarily is round time into convenient intervals to make a picture then go back to continuous time to fit the model. But having a picture to start off with is very helpful. So this is saturated means random intercept instead. So 
So we have the same uh, trajectories in terms of what the means would be over time, but we don't have, this model can't tell us about the variance structure because it only has a random intercept, so we don't know what it should have been. All right. So then in terms of the other baselines, starting with the simplest possible model, empty means random intercept, when can you do this? In terms of number of occasions, balance versus unbalance, et cetera, et cetera. Let me rephrase it. Where can you get a cheese pizza from? Anywhere. <laughs> Anytime. We can always do this. Because all we have is one fixed intercept that's supposed to be the mean across whatever occasions. And we have a random intercept variance that implies a constant covariance across whatever occasions. We can always do this. So we can always use the worst possible baseline as a jumping off point and then sequentially see if adding things to the model helps. Even if this model is a ridiculous model, and it is because we know that there's probably at least some kind of change, we use it for descriptive purposes to compute what piece of information that we would include in our manuscript. What is this used for? The answer is not on the slide this time, at least not on the screen, I should say. Oh, the Zoomers have it, ICC, ding, 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 intra-class correlation in this class, not to be confused with item characteristic curve in other classes. So ICC is my intra-class correlation. What does that tell me? How much <clears throat> the variation is due to within you versus between you? How much variation is due to between versus within? So it's the proportion of the total variance that's due to random intercept. It is also the average correlation across time within a person. And you can also think of it as how much of your longitudinal outcome is actually cross-sectional? How much of it is due to person mean differences that were there already? Because that's going to dictate then which kind of predictors are going to be relatively more useful. So we have intraclass correlation as an option in STATA. It shows up in vCore in SAS. And in LME, I had to build it, but there is an ICC uh, little routine that I found for R. So you can get it pretty easily out of any package, and you can always compute it yourself. It is the random intercept variance in the G matrix divided by that, plus the residual variance at level 1 in the R matrix. So we have the two parameters then as explicitly given here that form all of those predictions. And the intraclass correlation, before we control for any mean differences over time, so the unconditional intraclass correlation is 0.29. So 29% is, say it with me, level 1 or level 2? Two? 2. Between or within? Between. Between. Cross-sectional or longitudinal? Cross-sectional. Cross -sectional. Yep, there we go. And on average, our outcome is 12, whatever that means. So did we do fixed linear time? I think we did. This sounds familiar to me. So we have then in the fixed effects, which is on the model line in SAS, the time variable that I have pre-centered so that zero is the first occasion. And I have asked for predicted outcomes given by the model with these estimate statements. Same thing in Stata. So I have C dot time right after the outcome in the call to mixed. I have my LINCOM statements that give me the predicted outcomes at each occasion. And then in R, time shows up in this part of the code for the LME call and it shows up in this part of the formula for LMER, right? There we go, found it. Okay, so then, yeah, I remember going over this, but it's never, never a bad thing to review, right? Especially since it's been like five days since we talked about it. That seems fair. So relative to the empty model, after we include a fixed linear time slope, which of our two piles of variance should have gone down? 
Level one residual or level two random intercept? Level one. Level one, because it's a time thing. So we have explained some of the deviations around those person means by taking the mean and giving it a slope instead. The ease should be reduced to the extent that the slope fits better once you allow it to be non-zero. And in fact, the amount of variance that we used to have was 7.06 at level one. It went down to 2.17. So the formula for pseudo r square is right here. What it was minus what it is over what it was, that's 69% reduction. And we talked about the idea of explaining this in terms of r squared. Can I just say, I've explained 69% of the variance in my outcome. I cannot say that. But what can I say? In my level one, in my level one residual variance specifically. And if I want to put it together in terms of like, well, how much is that overall? It would be how much variance was at level one, which I believe is 0.71, so in terms of proportions, times 0.69, and that works out to be like half, give or take. So we have our matrix here for what's left at level one after controlling for fixed linear time. That reduction in level one residual variance made my level two random intercept variance go up or down relative to the previous model. And you can feel free to read from the screen on this one too. Up. Up, thank you. Yeah, it did. And is, is that like I screwed this up or is that just going to happen? It's going, going to happen. happen. It's going to happen, so don't worry about it. I wouldn't even report it. I would just say adding fixed linear time explains 69% of the variance at level one and move right along. Because the variance has to go somewhere, so you can just move it over. Not exactly. Over. It's, it's because of this correction right here. So what the random intercept variance is supposed to represent is the true between person differences that has been uncontaminated by how much it would just be due to like chance based on level one. And the, the chance correction factor is this part right here. So less gets subtracted off when you explain residual variance, which makes the resulting calculation go up instead. But it also then implies greater dependency than before. So another way to think about interclass correlation is that it is an effect size for how much person dependency you have due to constant mean differences. And after we control for fixed linear time, we had 29% dependency. Now it's up to 65%. So person cross-sectional mean differences play an even bigger role than they did before. All right. And so we have our time slope here. Oop, too big. There's a different zoom factor on uh, Adobe versus Word, I've learned. So intercept is 10. When is that the intercept for? Time zero. time zero. And we know what time zero is based on our coding. It won't tell you that. That's up to you to know that. And the slope for time, that describes my average rate of change. So for every one unit increase in time, our outcome goes up by 1.7 on average. And so then the predicted means that would make that line are right here. You could throw those into a picture or whatnot. And last but not least, I wrote a little macro program in SAS that computes the pseudo R square. And so this is the result of that output. And there's my 69% for the residual variance at level one. Okay. Any questions on that or parts that you want to hear again or differently? Yes, sir? Um, I think this is more of a generalized linear, or generalized model question, but would it, if we're talking about test scores, can we, because this is referring to test scores, right? Uh, sure. It's data. You can make whatever you want Y to be is fine. So <laughs> if we want to change the conditional distribution, um, mm -hmm. is it, does it function the same way as like generalized linear models where we just transform? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the question was, what if we're trying to predict an outcome that isn't supposed to be conditionally normal, like a binary outcome, an ordinal outcome, a count, something? Yeah. Everything you would have learned about how to do regression 
absolutely transfers to this. In that case, though, if there is no, so for binary, as an example, for binary outcomes, there is no such thing as residual variance because in binary outcomes, the conditional variance is determined by the mean and it, and it changes as the mean changes. So it shrinks it the closer you get to the boundaries. So R square for level one residual variance is predicated on the idea that there is an estimable variance because it's conditionally normal. If it's not, then this gets a lot squishier. So yes, everything that, that you've learned about how to predict other kinds of outcomes does translate. It, there's just more complexity to it because of the, those additional features. And it's also much harder to estimate because those models require numeric integration or some other way of approximating uh, the likelihood to work around the random effects. Okay, other questions? All right, moving on then. So new stuff. So random linear time then. So why would we add random linear time to the model? What type of research question would this answer? Yeah, do people change differently? Because the existence of individual differences in change is a logical prerequisite to predicting them. So if people change the same, like then that's not something that your model can address, like if there is no variability. So the existence of variability is, is the first part here. So in terms of the code, time shows up twice, fixed side, random side. So in SAS, the model is where you tell it the fixed effects that you want of the predictors, and random is where you tell it which variables get random effects. Intercept is one, time is two. The rest of this is the same. And so you'll note in terms of the structure of these things, we have type equals un on the random line because we want the G matrix to be unstructured. That is the only thing that makes sense. We want the random intercept variance to be whatever it wants. We want the random time slope to be whatever it wants. And we want their covariance to be whatever it wants. There is no pattern to the G matrix when it's set up this way that would make any kind of sense but unstructured. Now, given that, do you think that's the default in these packages? No, of course not. That would be too, too easy. The default is the diagonal gets to be what it wants, but there's no covariance. So you have to override that to switch it to type equals UN. It's type equals VC for R, which says E's have a constant variance over time and no covariance. One of the things though, that we can test is whether that's reasonable. And so that's the last two models in this example. In the equation, the random slope is picked up right here. My cursor doesn't let me highlight it. So U1 is the addition here that we've added. And how many new parameters have we added to the model in adding this random slope? Two its variance, which is the obvious one, and its covariance with the other U. So don't forget that, because the way that we have to test whether this model addition helps us is a likelihood ratio test. And we have to know how many parameters we've added to make that test accurate, so it's two. In Stata, I've got the fixed slope right here after mixed, and the random slope right here. So yes, this is not redundant. They go in both places because they do different things. And in Stata, I have also added covariance unstructured right here. That is the analog to saying, I'd like an unstructured G matrix, please, because it is also not a default in Stata. We have in R, fixed time goes right there. Random time goes right there. So this is the LME call. And I'm using LME because it allows me to build GR and V more easily than LME R does. If you're using LME R instead, then fixed time goes right here. And inside the parentheses next to person ID is where random time goes. So one plus time is random intercept plus random slope 
Over here, 1 plus time is fixed intercept plus fixed slope. So not redundant, even though it kind of looks that way. I am then using RANOVA to do my likelihood ratio test. And so what it's going to do is take out one at a time each of the random variances and tell me how much worse the model does without it. So it's the same idea, just it's doing the comparison model for you in one call. Same thing in STATA with the LR test command comparing the two models that we fit explicitly. Okay. Everything else in terms of the predicted the lines will be the same, just with different standard errors because it's based on a different variance model. Okay, we ready to see the results. So now, our matrix. What is this thing for? What goes in here? Yeah, level one residual variance. Now it's smaller than it used to be. It was like two something and now it's down to 0 0.69, 6, 6, 0.7. That's because part of the reason why there were deviations relative to the line is that the previous model had a common line. And now we've given each person their own version of the line. So the E should be smaller because they should be deviating from something that's a better fit. So the addition of a random slope its variance in the model specifically, then essentially, I don't want to say explains, but it reallocates the variability. Um, some people would use the word explain, and I really don't like that. Because what we have done is say, no, 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 no. It isn't that they're off their line today, it's that they need their own line. Well, why is that? Well, I don't know. Like, it still hasn't been explained in a conceptual sense. So we can say that part of the variance has been attributed to the level two model or rearranged or repartitioned is the way that I would think about it. So our friend G, though, what's in here? Broadly construed, what do these numbers represent? Level two. Yeah, level two random effect variances and covariances. The first one for the intercept, 2.2 is the variance of the intercepts. 0.9 is the variance of the time slopes across people. And 0.05 is their covariance. So then I have the correlation version G core in which that covariance is computed as a correlation instead. So a couple things. In the same way that when we added a fixed linear time, the intercept became conditional on zero, now that we've added random linear time, the random intercept becomes conditional on zero also. So the conditionality works both ways. So this 2.2 is not person mean differences anymore. It's intercept differences at time zero specifically. If I go back to the picture, not this picture, not this picture either, not this picture either. This picture. C versus D. See the lines spread out? So you would come to a different conclusion about intercept differences between people based on where you are in time. So random intercept, you need to, it becomes at wherever time zero is. And so this is a conceptual choice. Like where do you want a snapshot of individual differences? Do you want to be able to predict why people start differently? Okay, put your zero at the beginning. Do you want to predict differences in where people end up? That's a different question. If so, put zero at the end. Yes? So if you were to uh, visualize this, would mm -hmm. you find, like, at x equals zero, that the average distance between the intercepts is two point, or no? Not quite. Okay. Uh, if you want to go average distance, you'd have to square root this thing, because okay. this is a variance. But yeah, you can think of it that way. Okay. Average distance from the prediction at time zero would be the square root of that number. Yep. So it's the conditionality that I'm trying to hammer home here. Once we add a random time slope, the random intercept is conditional on the zero value that goes with the slope as a general concept. 
in the same way that if we add a predictor slope on the mean side, the intercept becomes conditional on the zero value of the predictor slope on the mean side. I also want to make this point because I've seen this go awry. So I had a, a postdoc that I was helping fit a very complicated version of basically this model, but it was in a multi-level structural equation model with all kinds of other fancy stuff going on. And her model was blowing up, like wouldn't work, not converge, not converge. And so she sent it to me and she's like, what's the problem? I can't make it go. The problem is that she was a cognitive aging researcher examining change as a function of age in older adults. There's no problem with that, except that she was using age as time, and she forgot to center age. So she was asking her very complicated model to come up with individual differences at time zero, age zero, for people who are 80 to 100. It couldn't do it. it <laughs> So even if it could do it, I'm not sure what would be gained by saying, you know, working memory significantly predicts individual differences in cognition amongst the newborns that these people were 85 years ago. No, that's not a useful thing to know. So no matter how complicated of a model you're fitting, this premise does not change. Time zero needs to be within the scale of your data because the intercepts all become conditional on where zero is once you add random slopes. Same thing with other types of random slopes. So if I had something like stress at each occasion, and I wanted to fit a random slope for the effect of stress on my outcome, the idea that each person gets their own stress slope that describes their own personal reactivity, then I need to make sure that zero is a plausible value for my measurement of stress. Otherwise, I run into the same problem. The random intercept would be for stress zero, and I need to know where that is. So this number will change if you move time zero to a different place. It has to. Likewise, the covariance between the intercepts at time zero will change if you move time zero to a different place. And so that's yet another reason why this covariance needs to be in there, because it's conditional, and because People, how they start and how they change should be related. They're coming from the same individual. So there's a dependency there. So the idea of unstructured in the code for right here for the G matrix, the random line, right here in Stata, and it's a default in R. Can you believe it? It actually puts it in there for you. I didn't have to do anything. It just showed up. I was so pleased. That refers to the idea that this G matrix is unstructured. The intercept variance gets to be whatever it needs to be. Random slope variance gets to be whatever it needs to be. Covariance gets to be whatever it needs to be. So I once had a reviewer, by the way, reviewer three, alive and well, uh, in their comments tell me in a random intercept model, mind you, a random intercept model where there was literally one number here, the reviewer asked me if I examined whether the G matrix needed to be autoregressive or not. I'm not making this up. I was like, uh, I'm not sure I can take one number and make a pattern out of it. I'm going to pretend that you said R matrix and answer that question instead. Because that is actually a valid point. This model is saying, what about the level 1 E residuals? their constant variance, and what kind of correlation do they have? Nothing. Nothing. So I pretended the reviewer meant to say that, and I said, good point. Let's check it. It didn't help the model. Moving on. Thank you for allowing us to explore that suggestion. There's only two proper responses to reviewer three. It's either I'm sorry or thank you. That's it. Every sentence has to begin with one of those two. If they didn't understand what you meant, it's, I'm sorry we were not sufficiently clear. If they said, you should do X, Y, and Z, thank you for the opportunity to explore our data further. But no, there is no other kind of G matrix that makes any kind of sense. What kind of R matrix you have, though, does make sense as a question. Because what this model is saying is that the only reason that the E residuals were related is due to these two things. 
two kinds of dependency now. Dependency because of constant mean differences, that's intercept. Dependency that's different because of changes that differ between people, that's random slope. Okay. How are we doing? Question? If you want to be really cheeky with your viewer number three, could you have just said, oh, the um, correlation is 0.05 for um, or would that not be random? So in that case, I literally only had a random intercept, so there wasn't any possible other thing it could be. In this case, um, an autoregressive pattern would refer to this number having to be squared and cubed for all yeah. the other entries that aren't here. So no, still no on that one. But then an AR structure by de usually it means homogeneous variances, which then that would be even dumber because then you'd be saying that my intercept variance has to be the same size as my slope variance. And that makes no kind of sense either. They mean completely different things. All right. So then we get to V here. So the idea from before is that we take the G matrix, we combine it with the R matrix, and we get this thing. So it's like, huh, how'd that happen? Well, we can't just take the random intercept and just like stick it everywhere like we did before. So there's a little bit of behind the scenes uh, matrix manipulations that lead to this prediction, which is what I skipped to show you the numbers. <laughs> so where this predicted pattern came from, we have not talked about yet, but we can look at the pattern itself for these data. And so the V matrix is level one residual and level two random effects put back together again. So marginal or total or however you want to think about that. So 2.96 is the model predicted total variance at the first occasion. 3.97 whatever is the model predicted variance at the second occasion. And look at this. What do you see about these numbers? Same or different over time? Different. Different random or different in a pattern? Pattern. Pattern. Yeah, they're increasing. Just like it did in the data. It's amazing. So cool. And it's hard to tell what's happening with the covariances, but if we look at the correlation pattern, same or different? Different. Different, different in a pattern? Mm, yeah. Kinda. Kinda. It, it looks like occasions closer together are more similar, but not to the same extent. It depends on which occasions you're talking about. So the, the quick answer is that adding a random slope creates a predicted pattern of variance over time that's quadratic. It's U-shaped, it's a parabola. The predicted covariance over time depends on which two occasions you're talking about, but it's built using the random effect parameters the variances and covariances. So the ingredients then that create this predicted V matrix, there's only four right here. Random intercept variance, random slope variance, their covariance, and then the residual variance that's assumed to be constant. This likelihood ratio test result doesn't help us decide if this model helps relative to the previous model because it's contrasting everything in G relative to just R but we can do a likelihood ratio test. So I've got the results out of SAS, which matches the, those of the other programs right here. So we have my fixed linear minus two log likelihood right here. I have the same minus two log likelihood from the random linear model, and the difference in the number of parameters is two to four. So it's two degrees of freedom different because we have added two things random slope variance and its covariance, but why are they so low? Why is SAS telling me that I only have two parameters in my fixed linear model when I know I have more than that? It's related to what you just did for your homework. It's Remmel, yep. So what counts? The R. 
variance parameters. Yeah, model for the variance. R matrix and G matrix stuff, yep. So fixed linear time has two parameters in it because it's level two random intercept variance and level one residual variance. That's what it's counting. It goes up to four when we expand the G matrix to be two by two. So the difference in minus two log likelihood is 48. On two degrees of freedom, that's a p-value that's super little, so yes, indeed, it does help. Hooray, hooray. Um, yeah, we'll do this with numbers. I have slides on this too, but I think the numbers help. So in terms of providing effect sizes to go with random effects, it's very tricky. So we have a significance test as to whether basically these two numbers right here in the G matrix are different than zero. It answers the question, is there, are there, let's go with that. Are there individual differences in change? Yes, significantly so. How much? Significant? Like, that's dissatisfying. There are people who would try to compute some sort of R-square about that, and I say that's silly because we haven't explained anything. We have reallocated some of our residual variance to level 2 instead. It's still error, though, conceptually. So there's a couple things that we can do to try to convey effect size. One is a new and special kind of confidence interval. Now, this is not the same confidence interval that you learned about in intro stat. The confidence interval you learned about in intro stat describes the precision of a fixed effect. So it's based on the standard error for that fixed effect and then whatever range of precision you want using T or Z. This is not that. This is trying to describe the expected range of the slopes and the intercepts. So similar to the idea that you said, like, like building on the idea of a standard deviation as an average deviation, this is basically what would it look like for plus or minus like two standard deviations around my intercept or around my slopes. So every parameter that has both a fixed part and a random part has the potential to have this type of confidence interval. And the way it's computed is as the fixed effect is the center, which makes sense because the fixed intercept is the average intercept, the fixed slope is the average slope. Uh, whatever level of precision you want, so this is uh, 1.96 to go with a 95% confidence interval, assuming infinite denominator degrees of freedom. And then the square root of the random variance that goes with it. So this is like two standard deviations around the fixed effect where the, dis the distance around it is based on the size of the random effect variation. So I'll put the numbers from the output in here. So 10.27 was the predicted intercept at time zero. Then we have 2.26. That is my random intercept variance. So it's right there. And it also shows up in my G matrix right here. Work out the math, and the range is 7.3 to 13. So this is saying that within my sample, 95% of cases should be somewhere between 7.3 and 13.2 to start out with. So in theory, if the metric of your outcome is meaningful to you, like you know if 7 is a lot or a little, then this helps to convey just how big the random effect variation is. Likewise, because we have a random slope in the model, we can also make one for the time slope. So the center is the fixed time slope of 1.7. The thing that goes under the square root is what, do you think? What is 0 0.91? Yeah, the, the variance of the slopes. So that's my random slope variance. That's 2, 2 in the G matrix. And if you do the math, we go, it's point negative 0 0.15 up to 3.5. So that describes the extent of expected slope variation. And this is where, if you're going to use this in a paper, you need to describe the formula and what it means. Because once again, this has happened to me. I made a table with these things for what the expected slope variation would be across a bunch of different outcomes. And reviewer three is all, wait a minute, this crosses zero. That means it's not significant. Dear reviewer three, we apologize for not being sufficiently clear. What do I say next?
reviewer says, hey, this confidence interval crosses zero. That means your slope's not significant, right? Right? No, because this is different. It's different. Than the other approach. Yes, but we can't just end it there, right? We got to continue the sentence. It's not a significance test. It's a different range. Yeah, it's not a test. It's a description of the range implied by the random slopes. So we have a significance test for the fixed slope of 1.7. We could make a confidence interval that describes the expected range that you would find for that fixed point estimate. Like what would be the expected deviation across samples that you would find for the 1.7? That's your typical confidence interval. If that confidence interval overlaps zero, that means on average there's no change. But this confidence interval tells me how much people are expected to change. So the way that I would talk about slope variability, given that it overlaps zero, it isn't technically correct to say that everybody's growing or everybody's predicted to grow. Most people are predicted to grow, but some people are not. And so when you try to think about the idea of a slope as a variable, this gets very tricky. Because what does high mean? If everybody's growing, that's easy, because then it's like high means you grow more, and low means you grow less. In this case, low means you don't grow or you go down. What if everybody is declining? Then what does high mean? Decline less, more stable is high slope in that. So this can help to, like, just even for your own wording, like, how do I talk about what high or low means on this slope variable? This tells you, like, which way is up and down. And it is a prediction. It does assume they're normally distributed and blah, 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 but at least it, it gives you a sense of just how big these differences are. And so if you are someone who's trying to use this information, you can look at this and be like, wow, some people are going to gain three at every year. That's a lot. Because three would mean something to you because it's in the scale of the outcome. So that's one strategy that I like because it's intuitive so long as you can explain it. Um, you can cite my textbook for this formula or you can cite the place that I stole it from, which is Snyder's and Bosker's multi-level textbook. Yeah, that's how it works. Like if you follow the reference chain like back to the original person, that, that's who really made it up. But that's where I got it from. I don't know where they got it from. What's very funny sometimes is when I get asked to review papers where they cited me, and that's why I get asked to review it, and then I see what they said I said. It's like, I didn't say that. Like, sometimes it's like they give me way more credit. I'm like, no, I did not invent this. Thank you. Like, but thanks for, you know, giving me the nice nod. And other times it's like, I never said it that way. But you can't complain without outing yourself. That's the other thing. So that, that is my policy, by the way, when I review. If I have to talk about my own work, I out myself. I'm like, you know, this is Lisa Hoffman. And, 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 so that way it doesn't look like, you should have said it the work of Hoffman at all. Because like, that's a dead giveaway, too. All right. And then another formula that I stole from John Willett, 1989. I don't know if this is in the book or not, honestly. I think I, I came across this later. This is the concept of reliability, and this has a basis for the intercept. This one is well known. This is uh, Radenbush and Breich, amongst others. It's known as ICC2. It is the reliability, basically, of the person means in a random intercept only model. And this is a function of random intercept variance plus residual variance divided by the number of occasions. So it's sort of like per occasion. And so with this formula, we would say that the intercept has a reliability of 0.9. And you can think of this as the same type of reliability that you would report for like a scale or something. It's how much of the variance is true relative to true plus error. Where true is intercept variance and error around it is operationalized as residual divided by the number of level one occasions. So the more occasions you have, then the smaller the contribution of residual becomes and the higher reliability becomes. So the same way that you, more items on a test should increase reliability, more occasions should increase intercept reliability. Analogously, I can do the same thing for slope reliability, and this is uh, John Willett's stuff. I stole this and rearranged the formula so that it worked for stuff besides time. 
it's slope variance over slope variance plus the contribution of error, but I have to rescale the error part to be uh, in the metric of the variable the slope is for. So this extra term right here is the variance of the level one predictor. So like the variance of time as a variable. Since slope is in units per variable, and so then it works out that my slope reliability is 0.87. So the slope reliability in particular is not something that I usually see reported. Where I tend to use this is in planning studies to do power analyses. Because if you can start from intraclass correlation or an expected intraclass correlation, and if you can make a reasonable guess as to what slope reliability might be, then you can explore how the impact of additional occasions might change things, and you can work the formulas backwards to come up with what plausible values would be for your power simulation for your random intercept and slope variances. So that's what I use it for, is power analysis. Um, but I think it's useful just sort of heuristically. The stronger the signal relative to the error around it is the idea. All right, 142. That's a great place to stop. So this is my attempt to do effect sizes for random effects. But ultimately, though, random effects are unexplained variances. We don't know why people start out differently. We don't know why they change differently. We haven't gotten to that part yet. And we won't get to that part for several weeks yet, unfortunately. OK, questions? Yes, sir. So we did the um, likelihood ratio test on the random linear time model compared to the Yep. Um, so, I, so I helped significantly. Mm -hmm. So would there be any any world in which you would want to compare the, the random linear time model to like an unstructured answer team model? Or is oh. it always, is that that's pretty much always going to be? That is a great point? question. So the question was, in case the Zoomers didn't hear it, is there a world in which you would compare this random linear time model to an unstructured model? And if you are using maximum likelihood, then yes. Because the fixed linear time part is supposed to be taking care of the saturated means. The random linear and random intercept and residual is supposed to be taking care of unstructured. And so you could, indeed, and that in the world of SEM is known as the tested model fit. Exactly what you just described. However, we're in REML, which means we can't compare models that differ in their means with one fell swoop. And so one of the things we'll do in the next unit is learn how to do that when you're in REML. And this is also predicated on the idea that the saturated means unstructured model is estimable, which is only true for balanced data. So that is, if you're used to seeing model fit as part of your output, say in a structural equation modeling context, that ain't here. It's because it's, it's not part of these programs because it's only even possible to do if you have balanced data. And multi-level modeling is not predicated on that as a, as a common use case. Great question, though. I like the instinct. All right, 145. Time to be quiet and say, see you Thursday. Let me know if you need anything, and I will fix the link to formative assessment three here in just a second. Office hours tomorrow. Have a good day.